winds was blowing. It's simply going to be a quiet, comfortable night. And of course, it turned out not to be. Charles Manson was a rock star wannabe and a madman. He could literally get his followers to kill for him. Everyone wondered, how did he turn these all-American women into monsters? I knew that people would die. I knew that there would be killing. He controlled them, and they did what he wanted. They were so young. And what he wanted was murder, brutal murder. If it don't get done, then I'll move on it. And that's the last thing in the world you want me to do. You're about to see what evil looks like in the face of Charles Manson. Yeah, we're ready. Well, I'm a sound man, I'm a sound recordist, and I was working uh, production for ABC News, and we were headed off for Corcoran, Corcoran Prison, to interview this man. The plan was we, we'd set up the room, and the very last thing to do would be to send me out into the hallway to put a microphone on Charles Manson. Come on, Charles. Come on, Charles. All right. You're set. All right. All right, easy. You're going to call us when we're done. Yeah. We'll come and get you. And as I'm putting the microphone on, he looks me in the eye, and he says, where are you from, boy? That's our full right? And the hair on the back of my neck stood up. And I said, I I'm from Los Angeles, sir. And he said, Los Angeles, and I've been waiting a long time for a bus to come pick me up and take me on back. Hello. There was tension in the room. Can you see yourself in there? I can see myself in there. They don't have mirrors where I'm at. Oh, really? So you so, never see yourself? Well, yeah, they got little funny little things. You get a close look a little bit there. Yeah. Beard's getting long. How are you doing? His hands were handcuffed together, chained together, and then they were chained to his waist. Here's the key thing to remember. This figure who walks into the room to talk to Diane Sawyer, who looks like he's been you know, worn out and hung up wet for so long. Do not confuse that guy with the Manson of the late 60s. Footage of him from that era tells a very different story. He is commanding, he is somewhat magnetic, and really a much more malevolent force. Manson had cut into his forehead, just above his, the bridge of his nose, an X. Oh, sorry. Then Charlie turns the X into a swastika. <laughs> he understood the iconography of evil, and he embraced it. Everybody likes that evil character they created, you know, you know that, that guy with the eyes. But you got to realize, man, all them guys you've been creating are, are not really real in real life. Man. And you're trying to take him in, and he is presenting himself to you as he wishes. So are you all from New York or some guys from L.A. here, right? A psychopath is born, you know, to do wrong, I suppose, and a sociopath is is transformed by his upbringing and surroundings into this person who does terrible things. So which was Manson? It almost depends on your point of view. I just can't seem to adjust to your society because uh, no matter what I do, it's wrong. If I were interviewing Charlie Manson today, one of the questions I would have for Charlie, because I'm fascinated how he ended up like he did, was start at the beginning, Charlie. Tell me what happened as a kid. Welcome 1934. Roosevelt was nine months into his presidency. Unemployment was still high, depression still deep, but a newsreel of the time reflected... Charles Manson uh, was born on November 11th, 1934. He just turned 82 on his last uh, birthday. His mother, Kathleen, gave birth to him when she was 15. His father was a man who left soon afterward. I am a street child. I'm a runaway little girl at 15 years old out of Kentucky named Kathleen Maddox. And she went to Cincinnati and had a guy named Charlie Manson. When he's four and a half, his mother and his uncle are sent to prison for a botched attempt at armed robbery. And she went to prison, and I used to visit her in the prison visiting room. 
The only thing my mother taught me was that everything she said was a lie. And I learned never to believe anyone about anything. There's a boy in class Char Charlie doesn't like. And at recess, a bunch of the girls jump this boy and beat him up. The principal steps in. And the girls say, well, Charlie told us to do it. Manson's defense, six years old. It wasn't me. They were doing what they wanted to do. You can't blame me for what other people do. Incidents that took place basically had nothing to do with me personally. By the time he's 13, he's involved in auto theft and armed robbery. And the judge sends Charlie to Boys Town. Well, Boys Town is real. It ran in the Indianapolis Star. The idea that, you know, we have young people who get in trouble, but we have kind judges who will send them to places where they can learn to become productive members of society. Charlie lasted four days, and he and somebody stole a car and set out, and they got all the way to Utah before they were captured. Charlie was a con artist even as a child. 1944, I went to Juvenile Hall. I didn't get out until 1954. I turned 21 years old in the L.A. County Jail. I wasn't out but a hot second. I've been in jail all my life. But while he's in prison, he hears the Beatles. And the Beatles, you have to remember, 1964, late 64, 65, suddenly they are everywhere. They are permeating our culture. 3,000 screaming teenagers are at New York's Kennedy Airport to greet, you guessed it, the Beatles. And they come to represent to Charlie Manson what he wants most. Fame, power, women throwing themselves, at all the money you could imagine. Hey, Beatles! Maybe because he knew what was going on out there, he picked up a little guitar and he started to play and to write some of his own songs in prison. There's certainly evidence that he picked up quite a few skills, you might say, in prison. He learned from the pimps. He learned from Dale Carnegie classes. Remember, if you want to be liked instantly, do as the puppy does. Become genuinely interested in other people and show it. He learned from the Scientologists. Scientology means knowledge or truth, study of. Manson used his time in prison to prepare himself to thrive as a criminal after his release. See, I never realized that people outside are much different than the people inside. People inside, if you lie, uh, you get punched. And when I got out, all your children would come to me because they never had anybody tell them the truth. At the last minute, when Manson learns he's going to be paroled, he actually tells the authorities, don't let me go. I don't think I can handle it out there. But it's too late. Prisons are overcrowded. And so they send him out anyway. But that one moment, he's being honest. If you let me out, I think I'm going to do the same things that I've been doing or even more. The city of Los Angeles has had another multiple Shot murders. Shot stabbed to death. Another bizarre murder. Eight murders Their without reason. brutally cut by a witness. Charles Manson, a cult leader accused of murder. Wish they'd listen to him. By the end of the summer of love, 75,000 people they are descending on Haight-Ashbury, yet everybody's got there because of this belief. We're going to change the world. And this draws a lot of broken kids from all across America. And here's Charles Manson, the ultimate predator. And so just as Manson is released from prison in California, the movement is like a magnet for all these people whose particular characteristics make them highly vulnerable to the thing that Manson has, the ability to manipulate. People tend to think that only oddballs ended up following Manson, and that's not true. Leslie Van Houten's a great example. And so she got wrapped up into that. And evidently, this whole situation was love to begin with, but it didn't end up that way. 
in Empire. Diane Sawyer talks to Manson's ex-followers. He was the first. And in these extraordinary interviews, they attempt to describe how their middle-class personalities were overtaken by Manson's charisma. Leslie in high school is very bright. She's gorgeous, all the boys love her. She plays baritone sax in the marching band, for gosh sakes. Leslie Van Houten is an example of how people can be very normal, but they all of us have vulnerabilities, and Manson could smell it. I seem to want more um, living out of life than what was expected of young girls at that time. Drugs, sex. You know, breaking away from the norm. Was living out and his father moved out. She lost her way after that. I think that when my father left, I was desperately seeking someone that I could love and hold on to and call my own. Charlie Manson would always tell her little puzzles to try to work out. So he would say, you can figure this out. You're smart. He always finds the way to make the other person feel loved, appreciated. He was like Christ, and he had the answers. For as twisted as it all got, you know, I really think that I felt that I had met someone that, by being around him, would have a positive change. I don't think anyone ever joined the Manson family who completely were self-confident. He could always find a way in. Manson met Patricia Krenwinkel when she was staying with his sister who had problems. Manson said to Pat, you should come away with me. You're so ugly, and I'm ugly. We're the only two people who will tell each other we're beautiful. That night, um, we slept together. And when we made love, all I remember is just crying and crying to this man. Because he said, oh, you're beautiful. I couldn't believe that. I just started crying. Pat Krenwinkel basically left with Charlie Manson the next day, and Pat firmly believed that she was going to leave with Charlie and he was going to be her new boyfriend. Imagine her shock when she found out she was only part of a harem and would have to share him. He had great confidence in his own sexual prowess. And what they really liked about me, you want to really hear it? Yeah. Real good. So he'd break people down, build them back up in his image, and they would become essentially fingers on his hand, subject to his every direction. These kids were putty in his hands. You know, it didn't happen overnight. He spent a lot of time taking middle-class girls and remolding them. I was an empty shell of a person that was filled up with Manson rhetoric. It wasn't so strange in 1967 to drive a bus, to give up all your, your clothes, you know, and going around and talk peace. A lot of times where you might have had someone say, don't you think what you're doing is odd? Instead, we were always in places where people were saying, wow, can I join you? The posse gets bigger and bigger, and eventually they all pile in that bus and they drive down to Los Angeles from San Francisco where they settle at Spawn Ranch. The Spawn Movie Ranch, which is in the northwest part of LA. All the cowboy shows from the 50s and early 60s were shot there. The saloon, the hotel, the dusty main street. Manson and his family just moved in there, and that became their base of operation. For Manson, like any demagogue, if you're trying to take followers and make them buy into your reality as opposed to anybody else's, you want to get them isolated. You want to get them away from outside influence. I was cutting off my past, and in my own brain it was like, I can't go back. You could absolutely not talk about your past at all. And one thing we didn't have is watches. The whole idea was to let time disappear. There was no time. We gave up our birthdays. Squeaky Fromm was uh, another young girl with parental issues. Charlie found her weeping on a bench outside Venice, California one day introduced himself as the man who's called the gardener because he tends to all the little flowers that hate Ashbury and that she should come with him and she did and I kept thinking there's this is fate because he's exactly what I was looking for and love is 
infinitely strong and infinitely mad. It's erratic and crazy. People have described her to me as among all Charlie's followers, the greatest true believer. She's a little more of a performer maybe than the other people in the family. You have to make love with it. She's very verbal. She has a certain childlike quality that kind of endears you to her until you listen to what's coming out of her mouth. So that you could pick it up any second and shoot. People who met him wanted to be like him. Men, especially, wanted to have that kind of charisma. So they would do the things that he did, but they didn't do them with the same spirit. Drugs were always an important part of Charlie's appeal. In those days, the enlightened culture was using drugs. You honestly believe that smoking marijuana, taking LSD, would open up your consciousness. I was smoking a lot of marijuana hash, and I had, at that time, I've already had used acid a couple times. But at that time, drinking and using drugs did not seem unusual because I was doing it with my high school friends. Charlie would use LSD for his special ceremonies on a daily basis where he would preach to people towards the end of the day. Well, we took hundreds of trips together. He would personally put the dosages in his followers' mouths. But when he took some himself, he was careful to take less so he'd stay in control. Sometimes he'd claim he was Jesus Christ, come again. He even would take up positions as though he was being crucified. Sometimes he would reenact the crucifixion when we were on LSD. And it was very realistic. And then make the connections of man, son, son of man, you know. And then the questions would begin, um, would you die for me? And in their drug-induced situation, they listened. So he used LSD as a form of mind control. And there was at times uh, basically group sex, but it was always very planned because it was a means of control. When he'd have different men that he was trying to initiate into the family, try to bring them in, he would offer them whatever women he had. Isn't that what women's for? Women receive men and reflect men. Man hold dominion up over woman. It's been that way since, <clears throat> since we grunted and we came out of caves. If a man wanted you, you went with him. You couldn't resist. I mean, he was an excellent pimp. Manson deliberately sent out the women in the family to go around and troll for famous musicians. They were the bait. That's how Charlie meant to use them. He thinks he's going to be a singer-songwriter, like Bob Dylan or like Neil Young. And what he finds is something very different and something that fuels his anger towards society. People would come down from their bedrooms and there'd be three or four people waiting to get a recording deal. And you weren't supposed to call the cops. He was convinced he would acquire a patron among all the rock stars who lived in LA. So Manson would send some of the women out to places where famous musicians live to try and make some sort of connection. And one day, two of the women in the family, Patricia Krenwinkel and a woman called Yeller, are hitchhiking, and fancy car pulls up beside them. And it's Dennis Wilson, the drummer of the Beach Boys. If everybody had a the Beach Boys were fantastically talented with that classic Los Angeles sound. Dennis Wilson was the sexy Beach Boy. There was no doubt about it. Couldn't play drums that well, but my gosh, he looked like a rock star. He picks up two girls, two Manson family members. He takes them back to his house, and he goes off to a recording studio to work. He gets back late that night, and Manson has moved into his mansion, along with several other family members. He came home one night, and he told me that Charlie and the girls were kind of invited themselves over and, and stayed for a while. One of the Manson girls talks about being at Dennis Wilson's house, walking around with the family members around Dennis Wilson's pool on a beautiful Southern California afternoon. The girls are topless, joints are being passed. It just sounded so blissful, and that was the 60s. 
always party time. Dennis really liked women. Dennis appears to have liked women pretty much indiscriminately. You know, initially for Dennis Wilson, it was great. It was girls, drugs, and Manson could supply both. We were invited by Dennis to come to dinner to meet Charlie and the family. There were in a group sex kind of situation, and it wasn't my cup of tea, so I excused myself to take a shower. No sooner than I got in the shower, door opened, and Charlie Manson stood there and looked up at me and said, you can't do that. I said, excuse me? You can't leave the group. And he looked at me with these wide eyes and kind of maniacal look. One of your group members is involved with something so weird. It was kind of frightening and, and freaky to me. Dennis Wilson loved having the Manson family with him for a while. He thought Manson was a great intellect. He nicknamed him the wizard. He was definitely under Charlie's influence at that point in time. Because Charlie could talk such metaphysical mush, Dale Carnegie, the Bible, and homing in on Dennis's insecurities about his own talent, Dennis was intimidated by the other Beach Boys. He's low man on the totem pole in the group. Charlie builds him up. You're great, your music is exceptional. And little did Dennis know that once Charlie got his hooks into you, he didn't let go. He was the perfect target. He paid for a lot of things, like food and transportation, and medication. The months that the Manson family stayed with him cost him then over $100,000. And living with Dennis Wilson had other benefits because Manson got to meet other people in the music business, rock stars. Oddly enough, the one he seemed to impress most was Neil Young. I knew Charlie Manson. Neil Young talked about his encounter with Manson in a BBC documentary. He wasn't what you call a songwriter. He was like a song spewer. It is astonishing to think that Neil Young took an interest in the music of Charles Manson. He's good. It's just a little out of control. For a few months, Dennis Wilson thought Charles Manson was a music genius. He wrote a song called Cease to Exist. Cease to exist. Just come and say you love me. Dennis Wilson brought that song, Cease to Exist, to the Beach Boys. Only he renamed it, gave it some new lyrics. It was called Never Learn Not to Love. And we actually recorded that song. I wasn't told about the origins of the song. As far as I knew, Dennis had written, Never learned not to love the Beach Boys. I remember Mike Douglas, and I remember doing a show. I'm your kind, I'm your kind, and I see The squeaky clean Beach Boys are singing a song written by Charles Manson on a Mike Douglas show. Never learn not to love you. In light of what happened, Boggles the mind. And when it appears on the album, it's credited only to Dennis Wilson. Manson was furious when he found out that Dennis Wilson had not only changed the lyrics, but had listed himself as the sole composer. When Manson goes looking for Wilson afterwards, and at one point leaves a bullet, and tells Wilson that I know where you live, I know where your children are, you know what this means. I gave Dennis Wilson a bullet, didn't I? I gave him a bullet because he, he changed the words to my song. Dennis Wilson was so terrified, ultimately, of Charlie Manson that he ran from him. With anybody else, Manson would have physically attacked him. But he has to live with it. He has to swallow it. Only because Manson still needed Wilson's best friend, Terry Melcher. Terry Melcher was the son of Doris Day, the famous movie star and singer. Hey, Sarah, Sarah. He was living on Cielo Drive in Benedict Canyon. Terry Melcher is a genius at recognizing how to get marketable hit music. Hey, he would produce the Bird's version of the Mr. Tambourine Man. Turn, turn, turn. He'd have over 80 hit singles within a few years. A significant force who could, on his say-so, have signed Charles Manson to a record contract. 
So this makes Manson all the more determined. Whatever it takes, he is going to make Terry Melcher his friend, and Terry Melcher will love it. Manson never, ever considered the fact that maybe he wasn't going to be good enough. Manson pursues Terry Melcher for months. Unlike people like Dennis Wilson, you know, Melcher was a child of Hollywood. He learns from childhood how to keep people at arm's length. You don't let everybody in. Manson, once riding around with Melcher and Wilson, they actually drive up Cielo Drive to Melcher's home. But Melcher does not invite them in. And that frustrates Manson. Terry Melcher, on the other hand, did take an interest in finding out about Manson's music. He finally gets Melcher to listen to his music. He records Manson at the Spahn Ranch, and Melcher talked about that visit to BBC Radio 1. I arrived and met a bunch of people. They all sat down and they played a dozen songs. It was a big campfire. And it was, you know, it was quite a, an interesting thing. Manson tells the family that Melcher has promised him a recording contract. And then Melcher had second thoughts, didn't think Manson was talented enough. He tells Manson, your music is good, but I wouldn't know what to do with you. And at that moment, Charlie Manson's life turns completely. Manson was furious. Because he did wrong. He lied. When you make a contract, what does a contract mean to you? When you make a contract, you keep your word or you lose your life. The dream of being a rock star is not going to happen. For Manson, the house on Cielo Drive comes to represent all he wants to achieve and hasn't been able to. And that is where he will exact his revenge. By early 69, Terry Melcher, this big record guy in Los Angeles, who's humiliated Charles Manson by not signing him to a record deal, moves out of his house on Cielo Drive. And moving in instead is this glamorous young starlet and her filmmaker husband. And neither of them have any idea of the place in his murderous heart that Charles Manson now has for their new address. Nobody took my breath away like Sharon Tate. She's gorgeous, drop dead gorgeous. You don't have to have credits. You don't have to have worked your way up. This is Hollywood. Beauty needs no resume. Hello, I'm Mr. Ed. Here's the thing about being in Mr. Ed. You're on a show with a talking horse and you're the girl. Well, you know, that's how everybody broke in. Sharon Tate is in these shows because she is highly decorative. That doesn't mean that was all she was going to be. That meant that that was her foot in the door. I first met Sharon, I didn't know who she was at all. She was signed to Filmways, which is the same company that did the Beverly Hillbillies. Hi. Well, howdy to you. You're Jethro, aren't you? Oh, yes, ma'am. The idea was to get Sharon used to being oh, on a set with a camera talking to people. They put a, the, the dark wig on, and most people didn't even know it was her. They wanted her not to look like what she looked like. And that strikes us as being counterintuitive now. But the idea then was that a movie actor was something special, was something who would never be caught dead on television. Let's go. And every time she met the press, she would be very honest and say, I'm just getting started. Being in front of the camera and going to classes are two different worlds entirely she was not a huge success at that point she was an up-and-coming starlet i don't like that word starlet at all because there's no such thing actually i feel it before you even make an appearance it's very necessary to learn your craft at the mgm studios in london sharon tate is reporting for her first motion picture Eye of the Devil. All Eyes on Sharon Tate is essentially a press kit. It's carefully crafted publicity, and we see Sharon studying her lines and getting vocal instruction and all these things that make her look like a hardworking actor. But you look at that 10 minutes, and the footage you can't forget is her on the dance floor because she is magic. Her name is Sharon Tate. She's today's kind of girl, bursting with youth, beauty, vitality, 
She was, to a large extent, very insecure. She knew that a lot of her roles were gotten because of her looks. She knew her limitations as an actress. I mean, she really did. I mean, she once said, I'll never be doing Shakespeare. Uh, I, I, I can't see myself doing Shakespeare or anything like that. I would love black comedy. We're on the set of the picture, The Vampire Killers, being made at the MGM Studios outside of London. And the whole idea comes from the brain of this gentleman named Roman Polanski. Roman Polanski was and is a great filmmaker. They didn't hit it off at first. They seem to have hit it off quite well afterwards. By the time the movie is over, they're in love. Gotta get off, gonna get... If you were just an average moviegoer in the 1960s, the first time you heard her name was with Valley of the Dolls. Mother, I know I don't have any talent, and I know all I have is a body, and I am doing my bust exercises. Valley of the Dolls, the novel by Jacqueline Suzanne, is one of the biggest selling novels of all time. It is like the ultimate beach read of that era. The movie, well... I am interested in a young lady with your, uh, your, uh, how you say? Measurements. It was perfect camp. And honey, let's face it. All I know how to do is take off my clothes. She had a purity. She had a quietness. She had a real yearning to have a baby. I'm pregnant. Which was the core of the part that she was playing. Valley of the Dolls is Sharon Tate's coming out party. Sharon Tate, star of the film Valley of the Dolls, marries film director Roman Polanski. So when she gets married and they call it the wedding of the doll, that's a reference to the fact that she became famous for being in this movie. I was her California hairdresser, and I helped her shop for the flowers and the bows. The After Party Playboy Club was probably one of the parties of the century. Everybody was there. Among them, Michael Caine and Candace Bergen. Joan Collins with Anthony Newley. Sharon Tate's co-star, Barbara Parkins, taking time off from Peyton Place. It was stellar. After that, she goes on to be in a Matt Helm movie. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, did I hurt you? Of course you hurt me. My father was uh, doing The Wrecking Crew, which were those fabulous Matt Helm movies, which were always fun to watch him. Uh, we'd go down to the studio to, to watch him do it. He thought Sharon Tate was gorgeous, funny, smart, and he looked forward to maybe recreating her role again in the next movie. Things were going to be good. Sharon Tate has married one of the top young filmmakers in Hollywood at that time, Roman Polanski, who has a huge success with Rosemary's Baby. She and Polanski are going to have a baby. So many plans for the future. We were hoping for a boy, and I say we because I come from a long line of girls. <laughs> and the symbol of this kind of idyllic success that they're enjoying in Hollywood is this house which they're renting. It seems like a place where only love and happiness can be found. And that's what the end of 1968 looks like. in the Hollywood Hills. The Cielo House had a number of well-known owners and residents over the years. It had been photographed for an architectural glossy. And it was a, a French farmhouse. The grounds were beautiful. It was serene. The views were amazing because it was off of Benedict Canyon. You'll never find another view like it. I don't care where you go in the city. It went from all the way downtown to the beach to Catalina. It was the most safe and secure and secluded and peaceful environment she could possibly think of to start her family. They came up and looked at the property and I met Sharon and just, it was magical. She was a lovely lady. For Sharon, you know, for so many years it had been all about her acting career. But the moment she found out she was pregnant, her acting career just didn't matter to her at all. Everything that mattered was for the baby. As we approach August, 1969, Polanski is in London prepping a movie that Mike Nichols would go on to direct called The Day of the Dolphin. Sharon Tate and her friends were at the house she had rented. She was massively pregnant. She was about to deliver her baby. 
and her husband was out of the country, so they had come to keep her company and make sure she was okay. She was there with her friends Abigail Folger and Wojtek Frykowski, and her one-time boyfriend and now friend, Jay Sebring. He was a sharp, charismatic person. He was the creator of men's hair design. He wasn't a barber. He was styling men's hair. Single-handedly defined the iconic look of nearly every male recording and film star. They wouldn't work without him. Sammy Davis, Jim Morrison, Steve McQueen, Paul Newman, Warren Beatty, Frank Sinatra. I mean, he was defining culture. This is like an evolution from a barber. Do you understand? Like the guy with the little pole in front, all of a sudden it was like on the cover of time. Sharon came back into my salon and brought a new client she wanted me to do. And her name was Abigail, Abigail Folger. Folger's coffee? Yeah. The last name, of course, is familiar because she was an heir to the Folger coffee fortune. I think this coffee tastes terrific. It's Folger. But she herself was working as a social worker. Abigail was a little bit of a recluse. She always had her nose buried in a book. She wasn't as open and generous in conversation as Sharon, a bit more reserved. Wojciech was her boyfriend. Wojciech Frykowski was a childhood friend of Roman Polanski. They go out at one point that evening to a restaurant to get some food because she doesn't feel like cooking. They're all staying at the house. They go out to dinner at El Coyote, which is a place everyone in the history of Los Angeles has eaten at. We know that they are back in the house by 10 o'clock because Abigail Folger's mother calls and talks to Abigail at that time. It's simply going to be a quiet, comfortable night. And of course, it turned out not to be. Because that's the night Charles Manson has dispatched some of his most slavishly devoted followers to go to that house and kill everyone inside, whoever they are. Tex Watson will become a key figure as the events of August in 1969 take place. Watson is there at every key moment. These murders are unimaginable without Watson leading the way. Charles Manson did what many cult leaders have done historically, taking someone in to something very bad, but by baby steps, never allowing them to see where it was that he was really taking them in the end which was murder. There is a late night visitor. He is the most unlucky man in the history of Los Angeles. He is a young boy who is selling a clock radio. And his are the first headlights that come up that driveway. And it's when he leaves that the nightmare begins. And his death will set off the most famous murder in the history of Los Angeles. Convict. I'm an outlaw. I'm not a Sunday school teacher. Hello. This glamorous young actress, Sharon Tate. Well, hello there. <laughs> and four other people at this Hollywood hideaway. Some place where there are famous rich people whose murders not only will get a lot of attention, but might actually bring some kind of sick satisfaction to Charlie Manson. So how could Charles Manson be guilty of murder? if he wasn't at the crime scene. When their hand was stabbing somebody, it was Manson guiding their hand. He would tell a story on national TV to Diane Sawyer, and the world would hear a madman. If you're gonna do something, do it well. Leave a sign to let the world know that you were there. Have a good day. Manson was a classic cult leader, a charismatic personality that became an object of worship to his followers. He draws these people to him, and he tells them they're beautiful, they're wonderful. Manson used drugs so he could suggest things to people in states of altered consciousness. After I started taking acid with him, I believed that he had some kind of ultimate source of power. I believed that Charlie could blow life into dead birds, that he could control the weather. He knew how to groom people and how to insinuate himself in their mind. 
He asks us constantly, each one of us, will you die for me? Will you be my finger on a hand? Will you, you know, will you be me? He began to feel very paranoid, a rage and a hatred for society. It's all of that that goes together that ends up taking someone to the door of the Tate residence. On the night of August 8th, Manson goes out and picks three of his women, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Linda Kasabian. Charlie came and woke me up, and he said, get up, I want you to go somewhere. And so I did, and he said, do everything the text says. And we were off. Manson's instructions to Tex Watson are these. You know where the house is up on Cielo. Go kill everybody there. Manson associated that house with his disappointed career as a singer and a music writer because Terry Melcher, the record producer, had lived in that house. He knows Terry Melcher has already moved. But to Manson's mind, this house on top of this beautiful hill represented rich, famous people. I told him to go do what Tex said. I never told anybody to do anything other than what they wanted to do. He told Susan Atkins to leave a sign, something witchy. Susan Atkins was a genuinely troubled young woman. She was Manson's watchdog, the one that everybody knew was crazy enough to do anything. Linda Kasabian was the getaway driver. And the only reason that she was along was because she had a valid California driver's license. They drove about an hour, and they drove up to the front gate. Tex climbs over the fence, cuts the wires. About this time, a car is coming down the driveway. A young man, Stephen Parent, had been visiting the caretaker. He was a friend. Watson had the type of revolver made for famous US Marshal Wyatt Earp. So he went up to him, and Stephen Parent said, Please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. I'm on my way out. I won't tell anybody. Just let me live. And Watson shot him four times at point blank range. And that begins the savagery. Watson talked about that night in an interview. I was so uh, high on speed that I understood what I was doing, but it just didn't make any difference anymore. Sharon Tate has these friends who are staying with her. She's in the late stages of pregnancy. When the four killers break into the house, they cut through a screen window and, and sneak in that way. They find Wotek Frakowski sleeping on a couch in the living room. Back in the bedrooms, Abigail Folger reading a book in bed. Jay Sebring and Sharon Tate in her bedroom sitting on the bed talking. Tex Watson walked in and he said, I am the devil, and I'm here to do the devil's work. Then Tex says, we're going to kill you. Everyone else at that point obviously was getting really frightened and scared. From the moment that Tex had said to all of us, I'm going to kill everyone in that house, I knew this is pure madness. What began to happen is a scuffle started taking place between Tex and J.C. Bring. Jay Sebring was uh, very protective of Sharon and said, no, you know, she's eight and a half months pregnant. She can't sit on the floor. And Watson then stabbed him, shot him, killing him. And then pandemonium broke loose. When there was a, an attempt to tie everyone up, eventually Abigail Folger started to get herself undone and she took off. Abigail Folger, Wojciech Frykowski make a break for it out in the lawn. I left and followed her. I ran after her with an upraised knife, and we went out through a back door, and I ran her down, and I began to stab her. I remember her saying, I'm already dead. When I looked around, I knew this is wrong, but you're a part of this horrendous dance. And it was like, no matter what or anywhere I turn, it wasn't going to stop. Abigail Folger ended up getting stabbed 28 times. Watson jumped on Frakowski on the lawn, repeatedly stabbed him and hit him over the head with the gun butt. Frakowski ended up getting stabbed 51 times. 
Susan Atkins stabbed Sharon Tate to death and told her she was going to do it. She talked to the media about killing Sharon Tate. I felt nothing. I felt absolutely nothing for her. Um, and she begged for her life and for the life of her baby. Susan Atkins, who had given birth herself to a child 10 months earlier, who killed a woman who's eight and a half months pregnant, who said, just let me have my baby and you can come back and kill me later. I mean, you can just imagine the horror that Sharon was in trying to protect her baby. But at that moment in Sharon Tate's life, at her final moment, she's thinking about her baby. She's not even thinking about herself. One word is written on the door at CA Love. Susan Atkins doesn't actually want to put her finger in their blood. So she dips a towel in the blood and writes pig on the door. I said, if you're going to do something, leave something witchy. Just like I would tell you, if you're going to do something, do it well and leave something witchy. Leave a sign to let the world know that you were there. Have a good day. When I got back to the ranch, we got out of the car. Charlie came up and asked everybody how it went. I looked at him and I said, Charlie, they were so young. Uh, we have five dead bodies. There are three male bodies and two female bodies. Movie star Sharon Tate and four other persons were murdered in her home in Bel Air. Los Angeles was gripped by fear after these murders. They were so bizarre. The next night, around midnight, the city news ticker jumped to life. The city of Los Angeles has had another multiple murder. And I shouted across the newsroom, it's happened again. <laughs> a call that lasted all my life. So you walked in. I walked in, saw the white rambler that Stephen Parent was in. You see, there's two bodies on the lawn. The words pig were written in this area in blood on the front door, and the door was ajar. Sharon Tate's body was in this area here. Jay Sebring was in this area here. There are puddles and pools of blood everywhere. That particular morning, it was very quiet. And the only thing that I can recall hearing were the sounds of the flies that were on the bodies. It is a scene, in my view, that was designed to shock the police. and on a bigger scale to shock the rest of us. You're standing here. Do you allow yourself a, my God, what? Who are we? What is this? It's tough. It's tough. All right, now let's go, one at a time. So the police, when they arrive and they see all these bodies at the house, the first person they want to talk to is the caretaker. So I got up and there was a police officer pointing a pistol at me and he grabbed me, he handcuffed me. I kept saying, what's wrong? He said, shut up. The only suspect, a caretaker, 19-year-old William Garretson, was released yesterday for lack of evidence. What time was he released? Uh, 20 minutes ago. Now, without a suspect, the Los Angeles Police Department must start all over again. I was a young reporter at the Associated Press in, in August of 1969, and I had been assigned that day to go out to Orange County Airport to meet President Nixon. He landed, I called in, I said, the president has landed. And they said, forget the president. There's a much bigger story going on. I was there the day after the killings, covering the story for ABC News. The latest in the case from ABC's Dick Shoemaker in Los Angeles. Police officers say the department already has given out, let me do that again. Police officers say the department already has given out too much information about the mass murders. My initial reaction was basically 
This is one weird killing. There were a lot of rumors that it was a satanic cult had done this and all sorts of rumors. And they were focused on Polanski. And the fact that he had just done the movie, Rosemary's Baby, which involved Satanism and a, and a woman who was pregnant, uh, it was just eerie. insulting, damaging rumors. They said, uh, oh, Roman did this because he was jealous of Jay. I mean, are you kidding me? They called Sharon everything from the queen of the Hollywood orgy scene to a dabbler in satanic arts. I think the one that sticks with me the most was live freaky, die freaky. Basically, by saying that, they blame the victims for their own murders. The victim of one grisly addition to this year's crime statistics was buried today. Sharon Tate, a movie career just beginning. A life ended at the age of 26. Murdered. Their son was given the name of each of his grandfathers and was buried with Sharon. You know that feeling where you just, you just want to see him one more time. You just want to be able to hold them one more time, and you can't. All of you know how beautiful she was, but only few of, of you know how good she was. The city of Los Angeles has had another multiple murder. Last night, a middle-aged couple was stabbed to death in a case that has striking similarities to the mass murder Saturday of actress Sharon Tate and four friends. And I shouted the across the newsroom, it's happened again. Targets of the unknown assassins this time were wholesale grocer Lino LaBianca and his wife Rosemary. Rosemary and Lino LaBianca die because Manson knows how to get to their house. Though he never met the LaBiancas, Manson and some of the family members attended parties at the house next door. It was next door to uh, Harold True. Harold True was my old road dog. It was a party pad. The last stop that Lino and Rosemary LaBianca made was to a, a newsstand, and then she glanced at the, the headlines, and she started crying, and she said, how could anybody be so cruel, not knowing that probably within 15 or 20 minutes uh, she was going to be a victim of uh, the same killers. So Manson orchestrates the murder of the LaBiancas. He's the one who initially goes into the house, cases the joint, comes back out, gets Tex Watson. They go back and get a couple of the women, Leslie Van Houten, Patricia Krenwinkel. I knew that people would die. I knew that there would be killing. Charles Manson told Lino and Rosemary LaBianca uh, not to worry, that he it was just a robbery and he wasn't going to hurt them. He wasn't going to hurt them. Pat and I took Mrs. LaBianca into the bedroom and um, the sounds of Mr. LaBianca dying came into the bedroom. When Mrs. LaBianca heard her husband being killed by Tex, she started um, calling out to him and yelling for him. And Tex came in and killed her. And then Tex turned me around and handed me the knife and he said, do something. Because Manson had told him to make sure that all of us got our hands dirty. And um, I stabbed Mrs. LaBianca in the lower back about 16 times. Following Charlie's orders, words are written in blood, including Helter Skelter on the refrigerator. The murderers stop for a snack. They take from the refrigerator chocolate milk and watermelon. They were just savage crimes, savage murders. Another bizarre murder in Los this Angeles. No La Bianca, found in the bedroom dead. Why? What would be the purpose? There wasn't an immediate answer to who had done this terrible crime. And that made people in the Hollywood community terrified. As it stands today, they have two crimes that are similar.
They have seven people who are dead. And they have no solid suspects. The police at that time really were in a quandary. And they came under a lot of heat from the LA papers in 1969 for not uh, getting anywhere with this case. They had mayhem, bloodshed, and incomprehensible words scrawled in blood on the walls of these crime scenes. I grew up with a lot, a lot of fear. A lot of fear in my own home because nowhere was safe anymore. Nowhere. Not laying in your bed at night. Nothing was safe in my world anymore. Panic set in across the city. Sporting goods stores were sold out of guns. Apparently Sinatra left town. Tony Bennett was living at the Beverly Hills Hotel in one of the bungalows. He, he moved inside to be safe. Steve McQueen supposedly drove around with a gun in the front seat of the car now. And all that was because for three months, no one knew who did it. Have you come up with any rational motive for the killings? Uh, no, everything at this point is purely, purely speculative. They'd found some marijuana and narcotics at the Tate uh, killing scene, so they start investigating who among the victims was using drugs, who their sources might have been, could this have been a drug deal gone bad that night. LaBianca had some gambling debts, could it have been a gambling murder, could it have been uh, a mob murder of some sort, so weeks were spent pursuing that. Sergeant Cook, can you tell us now how many men the Los Angeles Police Department has working on both of these cases? Yes, we have 17 sergeants and two lieutenants whose prime responsibility now is the investigation of the uh, both homicides. Are they working together? <laughs> uh, no, actually the homicides are not connected. For a long time these two crimes are not connected even though we looked at the circumstances now and we go, wow, they seem very similar. There was one group of detectives investigating the um, La Bianca killings, one group investigating the Tate killings. The detective squads that were following these were in the same building together, on the same floor. But they never worked together to try to link them up. They were there, they could have done it at any time, it just didn't happen. It was a botched investigation. Part of it, as I say, was because there were two investigations. Part of it was that there were missed clues. Six minutes and 20 seconds of moderate driving up Benedict Canyon led us to this spot. And looking over the edge of this hill, we found several pairs of blue jeans and what appeared to be some very dark sweatshirts. And then a TV crew who was out in the area found the discarded clothes of the killers in the hills. The police didn't find them, the, the TV crew found them. What we did, we came here and actually stood right here in this, in this spot and said, okay, if we had just killed these people, we are covered with blood, where would we go and where would we throw the clothes? Leaving from Cielo Drive, driving up Benedict Canyon, we timed ourselves and tried to place ourselves in the same position that the people would have been in that night after they left the Tate house. This is where we found it. It's right down there. When the LAPD arrived on the scene, detectives were not happy. The media figured it out before they did. Uh, we were notified by my boss, Lieutenant Robert Helder, who received a phone call from what I believe is Channel 7 News. They came up and found the clothing, which we introduced at the trial. It's a 10-year-old boy who winds up with the gun that was used inside the house. One of the Manson family members had tossed this gun out a window and a young kid had found it in his yard. Little Stevie Weiss, and he was outside playing and found this gun. And he went to his father with it. He, he had seen enough TV that he knew not to touch the gun. And so a uh, patrol officer uh, came out picked up the gun with his hands and then uh, took it and booked it into evidence in Van Nuys. He was a witness to the trial and they said to him, well, when the police arrived and saw the gun, how did they handle it? And he said, they put their hands all over it. He was very annoyed. And then it takes forever for the LAPD to realize that it is the gun that's used, you know, at the Tate home. And another killing, a musician who lived in the Santa Monica Mountains. He too brutally stabbed the words political piggy scrawled on the wall. There was another mistake. There was a musician named Gary Hinman who was killed out in Malibu shortly before the Tate-LaBianca killings. And 
Manson was one of the murderers there. And unfortunately, Malibu is in the LA Sheriff's jurisdiction. The day after the Tate murders, the investigators of the Hinman murder come to Los Angeles and they're trying to talk to the officers involved at the Tate investigation to say, I think maybe there's a link here. They never get the opportunity to do that. They're told, no, we're pretty certain that this murder is gonna be drug related. And they're sent away. But then, after all this fumbling around by the Los Angeles Police Department, they get this amazing break. Today, warrants have been issued for the arrest of three individuals in connection with the murders of Sharon Tate. We are about to see what evil looks like in the face of Charles Manson on the cover of Life magazine. And that is how 1969 will end. But that's just the beginning. When I stand on the mountain and I say, do it, it gets done. If it don't get done, then I'll move on it. And that's the last thing in the world you want me to do. Following the murders, there seems to be a state of high alert and anxiety at the Spahn Ranch. Only a few days after the murders, in fact, here come all these helicopters, here come all these law enforcement officials. Only it's not there for the reason we would all assume it's there for. They are there to arrest Manson and some of his associates for car theft. They were stealing cars from the neighborhood, some of which they were transforming into dune buggies. The arresting officers can't understand when they tell Manson that this is a raid because of suspected car theft. He seems relieved. When he's told, Manson laughs. And so this crazy, unlikely thing takes place where these two hideous murders have happened, committed by the people at the ranch, and Manson is arrested for a totally different reason. And it's the same kind of trouble that Manson has even written songs about. Clang, bang, clang, went the big iron door. They put me in a cell with a concrete floor. The next day in the paper, they've got a story about the raid and they've got a story about the murders, never realizing that you've got the same man perpetrating both. They have no idea what's going on. But on the papers authorizing the raid, they get the date wrong, which nullifies the arrest, and they have to throw the whole thing out. And they let him go. When Manson's released on the car theft charges, he wants to get his family as far from the police as he possibly can. Charlie Manson gets all these people in a caravan of cars out to Death Valley. He thought that by killing the people at Cello Drive, killing the two people at the La Bianca home, that this would somehow create this race war that he had predicted. Helter Skelter, the African Americans fighting against the white people and winning. Manson thought there was going to be an apocalypse, and he was outfitting these dune buggies with gun scabbards and machine gun mounts uh, to be ready to fight. It was like Mad Max. Manson would get them together, and they were riding around in their dune buggies, firing off guns, getting ready for the race war. And that was really a big mistake for Manson, and that's what brought law enforcement there. And when we were in the desert, he said, if they ever capture me again, the men in the black robes, I'm just going to be crazy old Charlie that all of you took care of. So if he plays sort of the dumb old Charlie, I've got mental health issues, to have the girl sort of spin that to, to the police. In his mind, he thinks that might work. The California Highway Patrol officer, James Purcell, had come to Barker Ranch. You got to understand, we had no idea what we had. We felt we were working with a bunch of hippies uh, that were an auto theft gang. Purcell has a candle in one hand, the light is fading. He's got his 357 Magnum in another hand and he walks into the house. It's terrifying. Below the sink was a small cupboard and hair was hanging out over the top of the cupboard door. Fingers began wiggling in the hair and the door opened and this figure began coming out. He says, come out and don't do anything or I'll shoot you. He came out 
And I'll never forget the first thing he said was, hi. And I said, who are you? And he identified himself as Charles Manson. We dumped 26 people in the jail. Krenwinkel, Atkins, Squeaky, they were all in the first group. Charlie is originally charged in Death Valley again with car theft. It's only after Susan Atkins, one of Charlie's followers who was involved in the various murders, is transferred back to LA that she tries to impress some fellow inmates that things start to get put together. It's like all the king's horses and all the king's men tried to solve this crime. But Susan Atkins had a secret that she had to share. She started saying about how stupid the police were and how uh, they really uh, were on the wrong, wrong track on a lot of crimes. And I do recall saying to her, well, what are you talking about? And her answer to me was, well, you know those murders of Benedict Canyon? And I said, yeah. Uh, and uh, she said to me, well, you know who did it, don't you? And I said, no. And she says, you're looking at her. The die was cast, you might say. And uh, Charlie probably knew his time was up. The men and women suspected of killing actress Sharon Tate and four others were members of a weird, sadistic, hippie cult. And by writing the words pig at the scene of the crime, apparently the hippies were trying to throw the police off the track by blaming the murders on the Black Panthers, a group the hippies hated. Manson and his followers had been arrested, finally, for the Tate LaBianca murders. And what lay ahead was a murder trial and a circus that would both fascinate and appall everyone who watched. Charlie, can you look this way, please? And they watched every night. Sneaking like little children out of town. <laughs> sneaking, <laughs> sneaking all around the courthouse. Manson's efforts to portray himself as the lone fighter against an unfair establishment are not working. The Tate LaBianca murder trial may be the most widely documented of its time. Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, Leslie Van Houten, and Charlie go on trial for capital murder. It was insanity from beginning to end. It was a circus. It was on television every night. It was spectacle. The trial started in 1970 and went on for almost a year. Every day in that trial, spontaneous random acts of insanity by Manson or the three women defendants. Manson would come in suspicious or charming, demonic or eerily, you know, amiable. Even more shocking were the sight of the three women. How do you feel, Miss Frederick? In these colorful dresses, sometimes they'd be singing. The contrast between the savagery of the crime and the kind of carefree nature, it was deeply unsettling. Every bit of it was planned out by Charles Manson. The entire proceedings were scripted by Charlie. Every day we'd meet and he'd decide, well, today I want you each to stand up and hold your hands in some stupid symbols. You're going to get up and scream, the old gray mare. You're going to get up and burn an X in your head. You're going to go bald. And that day we proceeded through the events as he said it. And most of the time we were upstairs because we'd get thrown out of court and we'd just sit upstairs. Outside the courtroom, the Manson girls who had not gone along on the killings but were dedicated to him were camped outside the courthouse. They lived there. They slept there. They were available for interviews at all times. It was a scene outside that was almost equal to what was going on inside. There's a revolution coming very soon. The astonishing thing is these are people with absolute loyalty to Charles Manson even though Manson has been in custody for months, and yet their worshipful fidelity, their absolute loyalty is unshakable. Hello. Manson himself was uncontrollable. At one point, he leaped across the council table at the judge with a pencil in his hand, screaming, someone should cut your head off, old man. And a bailiff tackled him in midair as he was heading towards the judge. And 
What we heard was that after that incident that the judge started carrying a revolver. I noted, for example, the coverage of the Charles Manson case. Richard Nixon was one of the best helpers Charlie Manson had during the trial. He was at a law enforcement seminar, and they asked him about it, and he decided to say that Charlie was guilty. Here is a man who was guilty, uh, directly or indirectly, of eight murders without reason. That became a huge story, huge headline. One of the uh, defense attorneys had slipped Manson a newspaper. All of a sudden, in the courtroom, Manson picks up the LA Times newspaper that says, Manson guilty, Nixon declares, and showed it to the jury. Manson thought at that point he would cause a mistrial, but the judge wasn't buying it. How would the prosecution tie Manson into these crimes that had been physically committed by other people? Vincent Bugliosi is the deputy district attorney that prosecutes Manson and his followers. Originally, the Los Angeles prosecutor's office plan was to present this as a robbery gone wrong, where the victims died, and that made it murder. Bugliosi thought it was something beyond that. And he was the one from the start who said, we need to use Helter Skelter. What does Helter Skelter mean? Well, and where does it come to, from? To Charles Manson, Helter Skelter means the black man rising up against the white establishment and murdering the entire white race. That is, with the exception of Charlie and his family who intended to escape to the desert and live in the bottomless pit, a place that he got from Revelation 9. Vincent Bugliosi is the one who saw that Manson's fascination with the Beatles' White Album could be part of this. He's the one that, in his questioning of the Manson family members, got them to talk about Manson stating that the race war is coming, we know, because the Beatles have told us in the song Piggy, in the song Blackbird, most of all in the song Helter Skelter. And their strategy was to take those words that had been written on the wall at the La Bianca home and to develop from those words Manson's theory of this apocalyptic race war. And I told the jury that when the words Helter Skelter were found printed in blood at the murder scene, this was tantamount to Manson's fingerprints being found uh, at the scene. When Bugliosi did this, Helter Skelter, he was able then to quantify the type of hold that Manson had over his followers. If Manson can get them to believe the Beatles are telling them a race war is coming, is it such a huge step that Manson would get them to believe it was their idea to go out and murder people? That was, I think, the genius of the whole Helter Skelter presentation. Today in court, the prosecution's key witness, Linda Kasabian, continued to testify. Linda Kasabian had been the driver on both the night of August 9th and the night of August 10th. We granted Linda Kasabian uh, immunity, so she was our star witness. She was an accomplice. She was equally guilty. She saw everything. She didn't physically kill anyone. And had he not had her, Bugliosi might have lost the case, because there was no one else that could give an eyewitness account. She said that she was outside on the lawn. Frykowski is who she was referring to. She said, a man came toward me, and he was bleeding and he had been stabbed, and I said to myself, oh God, make this stop. Manson stared at Mrs. Kasabian and said, you have lied three times. The next lie, number four, will harm you. One of the attorneys is Ronald Hughes. He's Leslie Van Houten's attorney. Hughes started to really represent Van Houten and tried to split her off from, uh, from the others. Manson didn't care anything about the women. He wanted all the defense attorneys to represent him. Manson specifically told the women to testify that he had nothing to do with the murders. And the attorneys realized that their clients were doing what Manson told them to do, as opposed to what was in their best interest. For one of the women to have a lawyer who was saying, you don't have to be part of this anymore, that was very threatening. Manson pointed across the council table, and Ronald Hughes sat right beside me, so I, I saw this. Manson pointed at him and glared at him and said, Attorney, I don't want to ever see you in this courtroom again. 
and we never saw him again. And his body was found six months later, but it was so badly decomposed that we could never tell the cause of death. It was found under a rock that had fallen on him or pushed on him or whatever. It sort of looks like someone did him in. And then several years later, a former member of Manson's family called me wanting to remain anonymous and said that Hughes was murdered by the Manson family. Others say the death of Ronald Hughes was just a tragic accident. No one was ever charged in connection with his death. Hughes, uh, Hughes, I think the district attorney killed him because he was the only lawyer we had that was worth anything. He was the only one that was doing anything for us. You know, I think someone pushed him off a cliff. The jurors were out for nine days. The prosecuting attorney would note that as the jury came in, before the verdict was read, he could see the hands of the big, scary Charles Manson shaking like a leaf. The jury today found all four defendants guilty of first-degree murder and conspiracy in the deaths a year and a half ago of Sharon Tate, the actress, and four other persons at her home, and the killing of two other persons two nights later. They are ultimately convicted of all of the murder charges and are sentenced to death. The green room will make anybody terrified. Death for once was looking at Manson. We've seen Charlie do things that no human being has ever done. What can entirely account for the public's interest and fascination in the Manson family homicides of 1969? Their lurid claim on our consciousness. People see the urban legend. They don't want to see the faces behind the ugliness. And it continues to shock the conscience, both because of the brutality of the murders and because of this eerie cult-like control that Manson had over his followers. There's no end to it. I saw a guy with a tattoo on his arm of Manson. If you go online, you can buy baby bibs. You can buy mugs. The fascination lingers in part because he has. Manson and his family members were sentenced to death, and the death penalty has been overturned in the state of California by the Supreme Court. Many, many new issues. Prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi heard that news. Bugliosi realized Manson won. And the fascination lingers because she did not. Sharon was eerily beautiful. A beauty dying young is always a kind of show business trope, and it leaves us with these luminous images that never fade. She just seemed eager. She seemed wholesome. Those who laid eyes upon Sharon Tate for the first time seemed to stop whatever it was they had been doing. And the only one who didn't was her murderer. I told him that I didn't have mercy. Now she also is 